time seeing music, I was like, oh, I get it. Like, this isn't for me. <laughs> I, I knew that was going into it. Like, getting into two, but you don't do it feeling like um, you're going to be surrounded by women all the time. Um, but, like, go, you keep going forward, taking steps. And, and that was one of those moments where it just hit me in the face again, where even in a studio with women, even in a marching band that had two section and those half women, the tuba repertoire is still not for women. Um, my, I'm clearly a very high-pitched person. <laughs> uh, I identify as a soprano. Um, and so a lot of the repertoire didn't overlap with my singing range like, at all. Um, and I keep uh, talking to other people who've tried multi-monics and maybe experimented with it. And a lot of the response I get from women is just like, I just am not that good at it. <laughs> and, and I can't help but feel like that's it's very much influenced by the fact that why are you stepping outside of what your body is built for? And, and there's nothing wrong with that. And it feels very much like the individual having to make these adjustments or um, trying to fix their, the problem that is their self, bringing themselves to this music. So I wanted to finally approach this. Uh, thankfully, I was finishing up my dissertation you know, during COVID. And, and so that meant um, a lot of playing by myself. And <laughs> multi-funding repertoire um, came, came to the forefront again. And, and I figured I, I finally wanted to tackle it, uh, and that included playing Encounters 2 for the first time, which has been always um, a haunting presence, I think, for tuba players especially. Um, it feels like it was composed and performed to stretch the limits of what's possible. Um, and yet, it was still included on the New York Phil audition uh, for uh, the principal tuba when it went on there on it. Um, keep that in mind. That was a piece of multiphonics, that's a core part of it, um, and now it's This is just a, a, a graphic plot on the study of the voice. I found really interesting because um, it, it not only includes vocal range and pitch and finding some overlap, but it also talks about register. Um, earlier, I found myself doing my, my full chest voice, <laughs> um, but of course, there's many different ways to sing. And I want to bring up register as well because often when we think about what is a common range for all people, which I feel like is a, a, a daunting task, <laughs> maybe impossible. Uh, you might find men with lower voices singing in their upper falsetto, and, and then many women singing in their, in their low chest voice. And I don't want us to pretend that because the pitch is common and it's possible that we're not getting the same musical effect. Um, and it's also, you can really see that dynamics are um, a little bit tied <laughs> to, to range. I know we experienced that with brass playing as well, uh, and that also can uh, affect the balance when it comes to multi and also, can I just say, everything that talks about voice talks about it in a binary, whether it's ma male and female or high and low. And that's not our experience as people. Um, even when we start dividing up alto, mezzo, tenor, baritone, um, they're still tied to gender and, and not anything else that might be more important to the music itself. Um, and so I think there's definitely a lot more room for flexibility here. When you group by gender in this way, you miss all of the variety within either of these groups, and you also miss the tremendous overlap. I've looked into a lot of different uh, keepers and uh, pedagogies when it comes to the expanded techniques, specifically multiphonics. Uh, Amy Sherry has this great, uh, I recommend looking it up, it talks about more than just multiphonics, um, but she brings up uh, some challenges to the performer when trying to attempt this skill. And I want to point out the word, the, this last one right here, the problems for varying vocal ranges. Um, we're going to see this pattern in a lot of other writings, which is borrowing this from Dempster, full quote leader. The problem is the performer coming to the piece with the wrong voice. And we're going we're to see that um, again and again in, in, the, in the word and around it. She also uh, interviewed a lot of uh, trumpet professors around the topic, like how is it taught, how are we first introduced to it, and most people don't really have a clue where to begin, and, and that could be a problem. Um, I, I spoke with another peer who's a trumpet player who hadn't done multiphonics before, asked her other male peer, like, he was like, oh, I can help, Let, let's try this, try playing a pitch in the middle of the trumpet range and singing below it, which I think coming from a perspective with a lower voice makes a lot of sense, but not when you have an upper voice. 
Uh, and so having a plan can be really important to when people get first introduced to this technique. Especially when it comes to uh, people with different vocal ranges than many performances, um, you can tell there's still not like a broad uh, idea of a, uh, an approach that works. Uh, Michael McCulka, who studied and I believe still works and teaches in, in Texas, uh, I made this incredible uh, method book for multiphonics, and it includes sections on both high and low voice, which is, I think, the first I've seen for it, honestly. Um, and I know this is just a, an obnoxious quote, I'm not going to read all of it, um, but I want to bring attention to that he also brings up register, because that is going to completely impact the sound of the multiphonics, and so that needs to be considered by the composer. He is a composer, so he's, um, I think, in a really in a really good spot to give advice on this, um, and also if you're a horn player especially, I recommend checking out this book if you want to, and there's a lot of etudes and exercises in multiphonics. Here's just a quick example. I know it's impossible to read on the projector, um, so you have to find this book, um, but you'll notice that for, for the low voice, it's all in bass clef, low horn playing, and singing approximately, um, okay, an octave or more approximately above. Um, the, I didn't choose like the first exercise, I think it starts with octaves. Um, and then for the high voice, we have in the treble clef, um, like mid to high playing, and then upper singing voice. Um, I appreciate the, the approach, but it still gives us a sense of like a false binary, we kind of have to pick your path and go with it. And, and also, the way the book is formatted, and it starts with the low voice, then has a note to the composer, and then has a section for high voice. And I feel like it's very, um, it's very interesting that in the brass world, it's very much a gentleman first um, kind of situation. It feels like, I don't want it to feel like an appendix, like an afterthought. Um, and also, I think we were missing a lot of interesting intersections between really close intervals, really wide intervals, that can happen um, instead of like if you have a low voice you play low, if you have a high voice you play high, uh, which I think has been for me one of the major like blocking points in, in me wanting to even dip my toe into multiphonics. Um, even in ear training, at, at Juilliard, my teacher was mentioning like, oh maybe you're having a hard time because your voice is so different from your instrument's voice, and um, I don't even know if there's a truth in that, but there's definitely I think we might socially have some kind of connection. So we have a method for trombone as well that talks about multiphonics. Um, I just want to point out that in his uh, understanding of what makes it difficult, what students might have trouble with, vocal range isn't quite mentioned. Um, but of course, tension and different things with singing um, would, could be causing problems. Um, earlier, he also mentioned when using his method to not skip any of the, of, of the steps, not to skip any of the exercises. Here are some examples of the exercises he suggests in his dissertation. Um, the first step is to play and sing in unison, which is probably one of the hardest things to do in multiphonics. Uh, the closer the interval, the more interference you're getting with the waves. Um, and I think it's also more difficult to sing below the plate note in general. Um, I don't think I've achieved that on tuba yet. Personal problem. <laughs> uh, so, not only is he suggesting to do unison first, but you'll notice it's also in the bass clef. I don't know if I can even demonstrate a low F or, or G. Um, it's probably like around for me, which is really hard to sustain, let alone while playing. Um, and I only demonstrate that because um, I think in general we have this idea that like, of course everyone can sing where I can sing. Um, but there's still so so much variety in the human population. I just want to um, bring that bring that to light. And then later, a uh, few pages later, uh, there's a very tiny quote at the top that finally says, "Perform exercises within your vocal range." Um, <laughs> so I'm glad we get that disclaimer. Um, but I also want to point out it comes finally when we have exercises that are far above the bass clef. So who is that disclaimer? For? Um, the repertoire, uh, since it's very recent, pretty modern, um, I think it's to 
just jam-packed with multiphonics. We're always trying to uh, push the limits when it comes to tuba. So I, I surveyed quickly in the, in the uh, tuba repertoire, repertoire book. Um, there's 85 included multiphonics, and that was in 2006. And a lot of the <laughs> works have been since then. I mean, 15 years doesn't seem like a lot until it's, it's a lot of stuff, for sure. I also want to bring up that half of those works, half of those 85 at that point, were composed for just a handful of prolific tuba male uh, performers. And again, I want to bring up, I'm going to be emphasizing when um, people do recognize that people don't all have the same vocal range of all, all the fellows around them. Um, it's often framed as a fact that the problem is the performer with the high voice who has to make those adjustments. Would you say that? Again, I'm not going to read all of this. It is impossible, I'm sure, with the, with the lighting. But um, this is from Stuart Dempster's The Modern Trombone, which is an excellent source, especially um, from, from the 70s, <laughs> on trombone performance and pedagogy. Uh, and he does bring up very specifically women trying to approach this music and approach this technique. And he makes um, a, a suggestion at the end that perhaps we should have optional parts for people with different voices so that more people can perform them. Um, to me, it feels more, more than a perhaps. <laughs> um, and I want to point out that this is in 79, and there's been very, very few um, pieces composed with options. Um, and before that, of course, he says, he recommends that everything should be written in a second tenor range, C3 to G4. Um, even though plenty of people can sing some part of that range, I certainly don't have a C3. <laughs> I don't know about you. <laughs> and um, even at the lowest part of my range, most men will have the ability to sing in that range if they, if they use a falsetto, most likely, which, which can be practiced. Um, but yeah, I mean, of course that, that stuck out to me and then was like, oh, perhaps maybe something higher for everyone else. Here in 2004, we have some uh, advice. There can be problems in executing some of the multiphonics. Um, so what we, what we see here is that women might have to change the music. They might not want to play it they might have to make all these other considerations. Um, or a man who is a false of voice. Like that feels like not quite an even um, trade off with what we're dealing with when approaching multiphonics. In 2006, we have advice that if there is a problem with vocal range, it is okay to sing an octave higher, which is nice. I think that's the easiest way we approach multiphonics now, is if you can, just do an octave higher. Um, I know in my personal experience, I have gotten pushback on that. I've performed a piece with uh, multiphonics, and any time a teacher hears it first, it, and this only happened like on two occasions, but it's enough to impact my relationship to it. It's always, well, could you do it as written? Great. <laughs> Or like, have you tried it as written? <laughs> um, and, and there's always this like undercurrent of like, well, you changed it, so it's not what the composer had in mind. Or it's a different sound, and different might not be as good. Um, so, and there's also the, the line that says the performer should try to sing exactly what the composer wrote when it comes to multiphonics, which to me kind of contradicts the advice given earlier. I mean, I know as humans we have octave uh, equivalency in our ears. If I told us all to sing a C, we could do it. <laughs> it might not be in the same octave, but we hear it as equivalent. Um, but in, in modern music, sometimes pitch equivalency <laughs> has no boundaries. And of course, uh, Crafts Encounters 2. Uh, this piece is obviously not written to be accessible. <coughs> It was written to stretch the limits. Um, and so you'll see that this, this DMA um, in 2015 want, decided to point out that maybe women should try uh, and simply not performing the piece 
might be an option. In fact, all currently available commercial recordings and are performed by males, which is really helpful. <laughs> How do you figure that out? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and then here's a, a short selection of other recommended pages uh, that composers should use when writing for mobile phonics, um, with trombone and tuba being my, my main focus here. Um, but I want to point out, maybe having one range for everyone isn't a good goal, uh, <laughs> because we're going to sound different in that range. And also, what are we missing, right? It's okay that not everyone can sing or even speak as high as I do naturally, but it doesn't mean it doesn't belong on stage. And I think there's a lot more we, we're, we're missing when we try to do one size fits all. So yay, there's new compositions. <laughs> um, there's been a lot of progress in this area even since I, I started thinking about it, um, even before. So of course, uh, Carol Janisch premiered this piece just last year, um, and it was written for her as a multi-phonics. And again, sorry for the projector. <laughs> um, but you'll notice not only is there options for the singing line, which is all written in the treble clef, but there's options for the tuba line as well. So the bolded notes with the preferred, like the ones that Carol chooses to perform, and then there's options for anyone else. And I love this approach because it, it puts like a goal in mind, it shows you what the performer did, the original performer, while also giving flexibility so that other people can play it without feeling like they're missing something of the music. And I hope y'all heard Jasmine Pigott play earlier today. Uh, she also composed this piece for herself, including multiphonics. Um, for her, it's, um, it's a musical device to show that the performer can do it all. And, and I love that she's writing this for herself, for her own voice. I think the recording's on YouTube if you want to find it. She chose to write it in the bass clef. commission two works for tuba, um, and specifically my voice, and in, when working with the composers, I wanted to balance accessibility, but also pushing the limits, kind of in the line of encounters too, which is like, no, this is for me, look what I can do, a little bit, <laughs> which I think still belongs, and, um, and then also, what does it mean to, to write for, for more people? Uh, I met Hope Summonson online, it was uh, uh, great working with her. And, and then Carl Bershawa is uh, studying at Rutgers right now. Here's a, a sample of Spec by Hope Samson. She chose to keep the voice to a narrow range from D4 to D5 and wanted that to be the common range for all, which is higher than I think ever has been experimented with. Um, for me, that's in my, my comfort zone. Um, and, and she's this experienced uh, with peers and in the settings that she thinks most men can do it too, if they really use the falsetto. But I haven't tried that out yet. <laughs> I dare you, okay. <laughs> and it's written in the, in the travel club. And then the piece, Metal Occurrences, by Carl Mershba. This is the one where I really want to push my limits, and, and he sure did. Uh, it's rock music inspired. Uh, and here, there's the lowest pitch I sing. This still was really difficult. <laughs> and uh, most importantly, I really wanted to experiment with the high range. And uh, because it's, it's like a whistle tone almost. And, and I think in multiphonics, you hear that from Bobo. We hear his falsetto. You haven't heard a female falsetto. We don't even call it that. I wanted to, to try it out for size. Um, and if you want to hear what that sounds like, um, and of course the, the both works I commissioned and I recorded encounters to singing of the octave, um, that's all on my YouTube. Um, and also I recommend you to check out all the composers' websites and to listen to Carol Yarsh and Jazzy Pigeon's uh, recordings of their own works. And, and thank you for coming. And if you have any questions, please, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um. So I guess common practice for vocal performers to just trans 
uh, transpose the piece, do you think that could be a possible solution where people could just pick a key that's more friendlier to their voice? I think 100%. Um, it's not as much a practice in brass because I think it would just mean a lot of typing. I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I think it definitely should be and it could be. Um, and the, the fact that it's not a practice and that I'm like, oh, I'm going to perform this piece but in a key that I like better, it's almost, especially in the brass world, it almost feels like, um, like a consolation. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, you kind of play that low, or you kind of play that high, you know? <laughs> like, what are you admitting? Um, but with voice, no, it's like where you where you sound best. And and I think multiphonics is a great way to like to blend those, where it's like, no, be you. Yeah, that's a good point. And uh, if anyone thinks of anything else later, or just wants to say hi, I'll be around all week. And also, you can reach me through my website as well. So thank you.